This is the Human Action Podcast, where we debunk the economic, political, and even cultural myths of the days. Here's your host, Dr. Bob Murphy. Welcome, everybody, to the Human Action Podcast. Before we dive into the episode today and the guest we have for you, I just want to mention that the Mises Institute has a special giveaway program. Uh, it has to do with Murray Rothbard's classic book, What Has Government Done to Our Money? There's 100,000 free copies available. So if you've never read it, go ahead and get it for yourself. But also, if you know a bunch of family members or maybe you run a homeschool operation and you know some kids that could use it, all you have to do is go to Mises.org slash money and sign up. And uh, unless you want expedited shipping, everything's covered, including the shipping to get you the, the books that you request. Uh, so again, it's Murray Rothbard's classic, What Has Government Done to Our Money? It explains the Federal Reserve System, but also just commercial banking. And you give you a, a snapshot. It's written in a very intuitive style. And this particular edition uh, has a forward by Patrick Newman, a preface by Guido Holtzman, and an afterward by Joe Salerno, right? So just to give you some more context and some flavor there for Rothbard's classic book. So again, go to Mises.org slash money, and you just tell them your address and how many copies of this you want, and they've got up to 100,000 that are coming your way. Okay, let's get into the episode for today, folks. I am speaking with Matt Mahai, his new, what would you call it? Is it a monograph? Is that the term of what this thing is? Or a long article, maybe. A long article. Okay, fair enough. But it's published by Routledge, Monetary Policy and Inflation, and the subtitle is Quantity Theory of Money. So, Matt, before we dive into the details, can you just give the big picture of how did this come to be and uh, how did you get Routledge to publish it? Uh well, I got interested and to advertise the book you mentioned, by the way, what has government done to our money? I just cannot resist uh, to tell you that I believe that in terms of theoretical density and attractiveness, it's probably the best book ever written in economics. Now, about the quantity theory of money. Mm -hmm. Is uh, yours number I, two? Sorry? I said, is, is this number two? <laughs> Hopefully, uh, though it's a little bit, a little bit more wonkish, I would say. Mm. Uh, but I try to make it accessible uh, so that many people can read it. Now, I got interested into um, in in finding out about what happened to quantity theory of money, because quantity theory of money used to be a an acceptable theorem or acceptable theory used in uh, both in history of economic thought and history of macroeconomic thought. And, then, and until the second part of the 20th century, until the 80s, I would say, so something changed 40, 30 something years ago, until the 80s, sort of everyone accepted it, at least the very, very narrow way of interpreting it. That is, that there is a, an obvious correlation between the amount of money in circulation and the price level. Now, there are some tiny details about what happens in extreme situations, that uh, correlation is breaking down for some reasons, but still it was at the center of theorizing, and it was at the cent almost at the center for most of the time in the theory of monetary policy. Now, today, quantity theory of money has absolutely no relevance in modern central banking, in modern theory of monetary policy. So I was interested, hey, what happened? How come uh, mainstream economics, economists and mainstream economics in general is not interested anymore in quantity theory of money? Even, um, well, we still have it in very, very basic elementary introduction to, micro, to macroeconomics, but it's not uh, treated, but after you finish the basic course or maybe intermediate course, it's brushed aside completely and you will not see it in um, discussions about monetary policy. I'm not talking about the Austrian school, of course, mm -hmm. but, uh, but in mainstream economics. So we have... Yeah, if I as, could just stop you, Matt. Just, yeah, of course. Right, so I can mm -hmm. confirm, at least in my anecdotal experience, you know, I got a PhD at NYU from 1998 to 2003. I don't think I ever heard any professor use the phrase the quantity theory of money. I don't think anyone ever even said that. Yeah. Interrupt me any anytime you want because I will go on and go on. So we have a <laughs> Hamlet without the prince. So we have monetary policy without money. And it certainly started in, in the 80s. Well, maybe it started in the 80s, but then it got clear in the 90s. And then the textbooks that you have in the beginning of the 21st century 
The most important one, I believe, is by uh, Woodford, Interest and Prices, uh, the title inspired by Vixel, by uh, Vixel's book. Um, there is no, no discussion of money supply and no discussion, no direct discussion about the quantity theory or the quantity of money influencing the price level. All we have is the monetary, so-called monetary transmission mechanism and explanation how interest rates set by the central bank, uh, how they influence the price level eventually. Yeah. So uh, maybe one way to motivate this is I was, I mean, I was aware of somewhat vaguely of what you were talking about, but it really was uh, driven home. Let's see, in your first, your opening line here, we were talking about the BIS report. You say, in January 2023, a short study appeared in the Bank for International Settlements newsletter with a telling question in its title, does money growth help explain the recent inflation surge? And so I think maybe some of our listeners might be shocked to know that you know, this, and these are from top level academics with a specialty in monetary policy and theory, who, you know, the authors of this report or whatever you want to call it. And so it's kind of amazing to say, you know, after this surge in infl you know, the worst inflation in Western, you know, in the United States since the early 1980s, to say, huh, I wonder if maybe this has something to do with all the money that the governments dumped into their economies in 2020 and 2021. And that some people might be shocked to hear that, but yet, that's literally what the title of that report was. Yeah, but it's still, it's a pretty good report because it's actually shifting, shifting the case that we have right now. Uh, up until the early 90s, all the meta-analysis that we had indicated clearly there is a correlation between the money supply, broadly understood, M2, uh, so the broader one. Um, there is a correlation between M2 and the price level. The reason why the central bank has decided not to focus on on uh, on the money supply uh, is uh, comes from the fact that correlation between the broadly understood money supply and the price level breaks down when inflation is very low. Uh, when inflation and and there is slight disagreement maybe in the literature how low it has to be. Now clearly, if the in inflation is double digit, the correlation is there, no question about it. Money supply drives, well, money supply correlates, let's say. Driving mm -hmm. and causality is a separate thing. But clearly there is higher amount of M2 in circulation. The price level goes up almost one to one. Now, when we get to single price inflation or when we reach the uh, direct inflation targeting, when inflation is below 5%, when the situation is pretty stable, the correlation breaks down. And we see that manipulation of the interest rate by the central bank uh, is a more operative variable, so to speak, that influences the final price level. And this is something that was even realized by the core advocate of the money supply increase program by Milton Friedman. At the very late uh, stage of his life, he admitted that targeting money supply may not be a good idea to reach a certain price level, even assuming away all the problems that Austrians emphasize. Uh, but it not, might not be a good idea. The better idea would be to just manipulate the interest rate set by the central bank in order to reach the particular price level, uh, whatever, 2% increase or 1% increase, however he defined it different, uh, different po points, uh, different times in his life. So uh, the reason why we so, so, so somewhat forgot, well, we, the central bank has forgot uh, and mainstream economics forgot about the, the role of quantity of money was that Inflation was very, very low for a very, very long time. Well, relative, relatively low, of course. Not, not, it was not deflation as it should be in, in growing economy. But it was very low. It was below 5% in many developed countries. We did not see correlation between uh, the money supply and the final price level. So the central bank has said, OK, it's working. So why focus on the money supply? Just forget about it. Uh, but then the one reason they should, one thing they should remember is that if... If the situation is not stable anymore and you go too far in creation of the money supply, then the correlation is back and back with the vengeance like it is uh, since the COVID era when we created a huge amount of money. Uh, now, another, if I may add another thing, uh, why they, didn't, they did not care about the money supply was the case of 2008. Uh, you remember probably very well because you were writing a lot of important articles about it. Um, we had huge increases in base money, 
that is the money created by the central bank, uh, M0, uh, bank reserves in 2008. And many people, I was also among the people, uh, those people wrongly saying that very, very high inflation is on its way. Mm -hmm. uh, it turned out that this creation of extra reserves did not go hand in hand with increases in the broad money supply. And what, what influences price level mostly is the broad money supply, not bank reserves. But anyway, so the, the classic multiplier money theory or multiplier money multiplier mechanism that is described did not work at that time. And some people drew the conclusion, for example, Paul Krugman, your favorite economist, probably Bob. So he drew a conclusion that, hey, we created a lot of money and there was no inflation. And when he was asked in, two, in 2020, is inflation on the way? especially in discussion with Summers, he said, well, no, look at 2008. We created a lot of money and it did not lead to huge inflation. But what mm -hmm. he forgot was the fact that broad money supply did not, uh, did, did, was not increased to the same extent. It was, you can barely see it in the graph when you look at the increases. And I have those graphs in the book. You can barely see the increases in broad money supply after 2008. Whereas in 2020, uh, the situation is much different. You see huge increases in the broad, of, uh, broad money supply, record increases in, in, in many decades. And this is something that led to the breaking of the macroeconomic equilibrium of low inflation, stable inflation, and lack of correlation between money supply and the final price level. And the increases were significant enough to reach almost double-digit inflation in many countries. Um, and in, in, in the other part of many developed nations, we had double-digit inflation directly, like in Poland, for example, it was 17%. So um, money is back with a vengeance. Okay, great. So a lot there. Um, can you maybe, because it's so important to your thesis, I think, just expand a little bit early on there when you, when you were explaining the results, you said something like, like there's two regimes that uh, in terms of the correlation between uh, money supply growth and growth in the price level, uh, that is this a, a fair way of paraphrasing it? If you're looking yeah. at an economy and their CPI is rising at 20% or higher per year, you know that their money stock, like meaning like money in the hands of the public that that's got to be rising at a pretty high rate also. It can't be that you're, you're never going to see an example where their CPI is rising at 20% year after no. year and their money yep. held by the public isn't. Yep. But this the is opposite is, but you can see if, if there's an economy where the CPI is, you know, in the single digits or especially if it's below 5% year over year increase, you can't conclude, oh, so their measurement of M2, let's say, must also be, three or 4%, it could be a lot higher. You just, you just don't know. Is, is that right, yep. what I just said? Yep, yep. Okay. And, and, and it's easy to explain. Mm -hmm. uh, when inflation is very, well, the, the final price level, as we know, depends not only on the money supply, but it also depends on money demand. And money demand is influenced by many factors. It's influenced by pro the real production. Mm -hmm. It's influenced by the, uh, by the direct cash demand, as some people like to name it, velocity of money. Mm -hmm. Uh, and those three factors in total decide about the final price level. If we have, if we have a stable situation with relatively low inflation, reaching the uh, direct inflation target, then it means that all those factors have sort of like similar influence upon the final price level. Whereas when the increases in the money supply go high enough, their influence is so strong that it basically overcomes the influence of all the other variables. And then we have a manifestation where inflation is double digit. We have a clear manifestation that it's all about the money supply, even though there are some economists arguing that uh, double digit inflation, we even have people <laughs> with whom you discuss sometimes on Twitter, uh, arguing that hyperinflation is not caused by increases in the money supply, which is basically absolutely stunning to me because right. I think... I think that the case of hyperinflation and very, very high inflation and its relation to increases in the money supply is, is probably the strongest theorem we have, not only in economics, but actually in science in general. This is such a clear relationship that you will barely see in, in other sciences or in other aspects of, uh, of economic science. Uh, 
Like even in medical sciences, you will see poorer correlations and poorer relations that are confirmed uh, and already established and accepted by by uh, by their respective ex- experts. Yeah, I I agree with you. And for people who haven't seen it, like it's because at a fairly young age, I stumbled. I think it was Mil- Milton Friedman's work actually that drove that home to me. Just showing like going. Th- if you look, folks, like at any of the examples of like legit hyperinflations, and look at charts of the money supply um, and price level indices in those places, like yeah, it's it's not that. Oh yeah, there's a little bit of a correlation. No, it's it fits hand in glove. So Matt, just to make sure I'm getting your view is it's not that actually there's different economic laws applying to countries with tame inflation and ones where the infl- it's just for maybe one way of putting it is whatever these all these different variables are operating, but if you if the price level is going up by a factor of fifty every year after year in some of these places, it's not that like oh well maybe real output keeps dropping 98% year after year, like which is what would have to happen yep. if it were just a purely supply side issue that no, the only way you're going to get the currency falling that much per unit value is if the quantity of the currency is, you know, growing at such exponential rates. Yeah, that that, that would be a good summary. Um another another way uh we we I don't think we have clear cases, for example, of government going bankrupt officially when they create when they can create their own currency. And this is also a fact that is uh, uh, sometimes mentioned often. So similarly, I don't think you will ever ever find a case of hyperinflation in a country in which they don't have their own souvenir currency. That is when we have uh, um, economies that were dollarized or euroized using euro or German mark and so forth and so forth. You will not see the case of the country that does not have souvenir money and experienced hyperinflation and did not have huge increases in the local currency. You will always, always see this. There is a great review by Henke and uh, I forgot the other author's name. Uh, great review of uh, all hyperinflations, very, very short review of most hyperinflations or all hyperinflations actually that happened. Uh, they have a very good uh, table. I think it might have been, uh, yeah, let me look quickly because I have it mentioned. Okay, uh, Hank and Cross, World Hyperinflations, Cato Working Paper. Um, and it's a great table, shows you where all the hyperinflations historically happened. 90, over 95% of them, of course, happened in the 20th century because the 20th century is very, very innovative time for monetary policy because this is the time where we have a, um, a creation of fully fiat standards where the government could create money completely detached from commodity money, from any uh, real constraining reserve. And what happened until uh, under this innovation, we had majority of hyperinflations in history happened at that time. So so the relationship is so clear and so visible in, in, in the data that really it's hard to find something else in economics like that. Uh, and even, as I said, in, it's hard to find something like that in other social or even sometimes uh, more natural sciences. Right. Um, so another thing that you mentioned earlier was the different experience between the, the the QE periods. Like, so after the financial crisis of 2008, central banks around the world, or at least the Western country, central banks opened up the monetary spigots. You're admitting that you were one of, I certainly was one of them. I infamously lost a public wager to uh, Brian Kaplan and David Henderson on, on this topic about thinking that the, those rounds of QE were going to cause, you know, measured CPI to increase it's certain amounts and that didn't happen. And then f- when COVID occurred though, and you had a similar thing where the central banks around the world even dumped in more money. And then all of a sudden you did see price inflation. So what, what is your explanation? I think you already alluded to, but just to, again, not focus on that and unpack it. What, what, what happened? It, it, it's certainly not that the laws of economics changed from 2009 to 2021. So what explains <laughs> Why were the economists wrong in why, why 2009? Was it diff- yeah. So why was it different? Yes. I think the two factors are important here. Mm-hmm. 
One is uh, is that we did not have the similar extent of over indebtedness that we had in 2007 and 2008. So the asset bubble was way bigger at that time. And uh, the, um, uh, the, the flooding with the banking of all the asset-backed securities and all the mortgage securities was so huge that even though there was a flooding with reserves and lowered interest rate, there was still restraint in that recession on part of the banks uh, so as not to expand further into those markets. So I, I believe that would be one factor. Mm -hmm. And then another factor would be uh, probably uh, the policy mix. In, in during the COVID era, we had significant increases in public uh, spending. So it was a mixture of fiscal policy and monetary policy, which allowed to sustain the increases in the money supply and circulation. Uh, because in theory, if the central bank is just creating money in reserves, but those reserves are used just to improve the balance sheet of the banks, which are still shrinking its credit policies, then it might appear that we have a huge boost in monetary policy, but it, it might not work simply for the reason that the banks are not interested in the expansion. Whereas when you have the expansion and this expansion goes directly into government spending programs, then it's sustained through uh, uh, it's not utilizing, it's not sterilizing, to use mm -hmm. the formal, the former, uh, the formal terminology. It's not sterilizing the the, the previous increases. It's actually allowing it to happen and um, go further down the economy. Okay, great. J just as a quick, not to make this all about me, but to g to give the folks at home a little bit more. So back in two thousand nine, I was aware of the distinction between the Fed just sort of, you know, recapitalizing the banks or, or giving QE, QE and buying assets and then pumping in bank reserves. So yeah, the, the Fed's assets shot up, M0, the monetary base shot up, but M1 also went, not as much, but M1 did jump. And so that's why I thought, and then pl plus the Obama administration, they were talking about a carbon tax. They were doing, you know, uh, not, not literally socialized healthcare and single payer, but, you know, they were doing the affordable care. They were going to raise tax rates. So they were doing a lot of anti-supply side things. So I thought, okay, well, they're, I, I can see M1's jumping. They're going to restrict output. That means prices are higher per yep. unit, right? And that's why I said, but one thing that, and then after the, you know, the when it seemed like standard economics worked again in 2021, and I went back and looked, and one of the distinctions was, if you look at the charts, that Yes, M1 jumped a lot in like 2009, and that's what misled me into thinking, no, the public does have more money. But M2 actually didn't go up that much, whereas in 2020, 2021, both M2 and M1, even and they changed the definition, but even putting that aside, definitely jumped. And so I think partly what happened, and you kind of alluded to this, Matt, with you talking about, it was like there was a financial crisis going on that like there were money market funds that they, like, they broke the buck, a famous one in the fall of 2008. So I think the reason when I was seeing M1 jump, but M2 didn't jump as much, it was more that people were like taking money out of money market mutual funds and putting them into standard checking accounts where FDIC's limit went from 100,000 to 250,000. That also happened in this period. So that would make M1 go up. But in terms of the public or, or like, you know, a, a private hedge fund or something, the amount of money they were holding from their point of view didn't go up as much. It's just they trying to change the form into something that was more liquid and safer. And that made M1 seem like it was growing when really it was just kind of rearranging stuff. Whereas in post COVID, no matter how you measured it, no, the money that the public held went way up. Yeah. And to defend you further, uh, very early, like on at the onset, when it started to happen, really, it was not something you could know for sure in advance, which way it's going. So so we we just we just found out afterwards sort yeah. of or in the process in the process right just right after Bernstein's collapse or not Bernstein's Lehman collapse mm -hmm. it was not ab absolutely clear which way is going even though perhaps exposed right now you can say that the arguments for deleveraging uh, were stronger but you know exposed everyone is smart yeah okay so you said it here, and then you even had a chapter in the, in your long essay talking about this money multiplier thing. And so clearly, there's a lot of heterodox economists running around saying these idiots, uh, 
not just the Austrians, but even some of the Chicago types and just standard, you know, mainstream economists are still teaching their students that, oh, when the central bank wants to have loose policy, it lowers interest rates and it does that by buying assets and that puts in more reserves. And then the banks are allowed to make more loans. And so they pyramid. And there's, you know, a lot of people now saying that that's completely wrong. You know, that that doesn't, the money multiplier model doesn't work at all. And we should stop teaching that. So are you, anyway, I'll just let, what do you say in your, in your uh, booklet here? Well, I'm, even though I'm sort of defending quantity theory of money, uh, the way it is classically understood that increases in the money supply eventually result in uh, in the upward pre- in the pressure upward pressure on prices, and this is something you will see both in double digit inflation, and this is something perhaps you will not see in single digit or very very low inflation, but you can understand. But there are reasons why you don't see it, right? So so I would I would cite on this uh, uh with this uh, with this approach but at the same time are sort of i sort of share some reservations about money multiplier theory even though it uh it makes sense as a final limit um we have very often the circumstances in which in which uh the reserves may be very very high even higher than the formal reserves therefore even though we have more reserves in the system they are not translated into expansion in the broader money aggregates. Mm. And then on the other hand, you might even have a situation theoretically and empirically too, where um, sort of banks have even lower reserves, uh, but they borrow them from the central bank. So what is crucial here is the fact, uh, is, is, is the question of how big is the price for those reserves? So the the crucial uh, element are always interest rates and how the central bank is performing its policies because uh, the reserves uh, are offered at a certain price. And when we have uh, a private bank expanding, for example, creating a loan, a mortgage loan uh, for the customer, they just create a deposit and they create a loan. They create credit, they give it to the final, to the customer or to the final seller direct, directly of, um, of the real estate. And if uh, the, the, the bank has reserves that are necessary to realize this uh, um, by doing the transfer to another bank, they just do it. And if they don't have the reserves, they can always borrow them on the interbank market from other banks. And if all the banks somehow do not have those reserves, they have to get it from somewhere. And if there was no central bank, there would be a pressure on not expanding because then the interest rate would go high. Uh, but if there is a central bank realizing direct, uh, and I mean doing, not sorry, not realizing, but doing, implementing direct inflation policy, then they offer the interest rates and the interbank market at a certain price. So they are always ready to supply enough of the liquidity to keep the interest rate at a certain level. So in a way, uh, the interest rate equation always has to be included in analyzing the expansion of the money supply. And it's always there. And actually, when you read, uh, for example, let's take Minsky, Hyman Minsky. So Hyman Minsky has a great... uh, Minsky moment. There is Minsky moment, and he has a great moment in his in his uh, in one of his publications, where he discusses this, and and he basically says indirectly that if there is no allowing for the creation of uh, of that monetary impulse, then the interest rate will go up and the expansion will not happen. Mm-hmm. So similarly here, even though there is no mechanistic relationship. Clearly, you you will not see it in the data. I mean, the money multiplier behaves sort of money multiplier, meaning, for example, M2 divided by M0 or M1 divided by M0. It behaves empirically however it wants. You will not see a clear relationship uh, just by looking at the data. Um, So even though you don't see that, the important element is always the fact that we have interest rates set by the central bank and it's being set through uh, not based on 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 um, on considerations about liquidity or money demand directly, is just based on macroeconomic goals that we want to lower the interest rates to reach certain to reach certain uh, price level. So we keep it at a certain way, and no matter how much 
the banks are uh, demanding the reserves, we're going to supply them at this price that we defined. So if we do it this way, the money sort of is money supply and money reserves are on the autopilot sort sort of. They just adjust to the interest rate. And when you read, for example, I already mentioned, I already told you that Friedman agreed uh, that it's better to target uh, the final uh, price level through manipulation of the interest rates by the central bank. And then he said, but look, if you keep the interest rates lower, then it means that you're creating sort of a monetary impulse uh, and you still create some money in the system to boost the credit expansion and then lead to increases in money, in money circulation and then lead to further increases in the price level. When you take, for example, Michael Woodford that I already mentioned, sort of godfather of modern uh, theory of central banking and monetary policy, at one point he says, now look, the monetary transmission mechanism works through the interest rate. We lower the interest rate and then the price level after some time goes up. And at some point he admits we can still have quantity theory working here one-to-one because when we lower the interest rate, there is a sort of creation of some money aggregate and some money spending. Perhaps we don't know which index is the best uh, for that to see the clear operational relationship between money supply and the final price level. But still, it might working underneath the whole thing. But since it's problematic to measure the money supply and pick which index is better for reaching the certain price level, we focus on the interest rate. So even here we have an uh, admission that uh, even though we are focused on the interest rate in, in analyzing monetary policy, there is some monetary mechanism working there in the background that leads to monetary impulses deciding about the money price level. There was even actually a nice exchange uh, 15 years ago between Woodford and Nelson. Uh, Nelson is a pretty interesting uh, monetary economist. And um, he basically demonstrated, showed Woodford that it's not only the case that when we have interest rate and monetary mechanism happening through the interest rate, it's not only that the money supply can sort of in the background go up and, and, and this leads to increases in the, in the inflation rate, but he actually shows in the models, in the models used in the New Keynesian inspired models used in, in Woodford's examples, he actually shows that it has to go up, that it has to go up one to one to lead to inflation. Okay. Um, two things. So one is, yeah, your, I, I think your reconciliation of those views, you know, just like this is the old school money multiplier approach where, yeah, the central banks inject reserves and then the banks take those and make loans based with a more, realistic, you know, sort of like anecdotally commercial bankers can say, and I've had some tell me privately, yeah, I, I worked at a bank and when we approved loans, we didn't go and check and say how many, how much reserves or how many excess reserves do we have? We, didn't, we had no idea. But knowing that if there's a, especially if there's a legal requirement, even if there isn't, you know, just for prudence purposes that if somebody, if a customer shows up and says, yes, I'd like to withdraw $500, the bank doesn't want to say we don't have it. That's not a good thing. So they do need Yeah, reserves. but they can get it. They can no, get no. it from the, from right, the central right. bank. They right. just pay and just pay the price, which is the interest rate. That's why right. the interest rate is crucial. Right. So to reconcile all that, though, um, that's how I did it in my book, uh, Understanding Money Mechanics, which maybe we'll, I'll pick and make a note most flashed if you're watching the video. We'll, we'll flash. The thing, I read it, yeah. Folks. Uh, yes, you, I'm glad you did read it. Uh, so in there, what I did, because the Bank of England had a report and and I, I think you and I agree that it was my re attempted resolution. I wasn't even like trying to say one side was right or wrong. I was saying, though, that both sides in that issue, once you spell out the assumptions they're making, they're actually not disagreeing on the economics that, yes, if the central bank's policy is to say the federal funds rate is 3%, and then you know the commercial banks, if all of a sudden they see a lot of good lending opportunities and they start making a bunch of loans, and, and then, uh-oh, their reserves are, are low, and then so that would other things equal that would tend to push up the federal funds rate, which is the rate banks charge each other for overnight loans of reserves, folks. So then if that made the federal funds rate in practice go to 3.5% and the central bank wanted it to be three, they would have to buy more assets and pump and create more reserves out of thin air and pump them in. So that is true that in that sense, the central bank is passively 
responding to, you know, it's the commercial banks lending judgments that are driving the, this quantity of reserves and so forth. So that is true if you're looking at that. But then on the other hand, it still also is true that technically commercial banks can't legally create reserves, only the central bank can. So anyway, I'm just saying that was the way that depending on what you're assuming the feds or the central bank's policy response is that, you know, that that's kind of what, what you yeah. were, were getting at. Whereas if they had a, a rigid, so, nope, these are the reserves, that's it. Or if it was like a rigid gold, like a hundred percent gold standard, then it would be a different story. Right. It's like, imagine you have apple producers and one apple producer, meaning fruits, uh, not not the uh, equipment. Right, right. Uh, so you have apple producers and one apple producer can basically create apples out of thin air at any time. So if he makes a decision, the price of apples should be, I don't know, half a dollar for for dozen apples and can create at will as many apples to lower the price, then this decision to lower the price actually lowers the price. But it happens through creation of apples yeah. and the supply of apples. Right. right. It's not that he just disproves supply and demand analysis. Yeah. It's just, but it's a quirky, yeah. The other thing, this is a more technical point, but I think, tell me your thoughts, Matt, in terms of understanding, like, why would it be that it seems like economies where inflation, and by, and by the way, folks, when we say inflation, we're speaking, we mean price in inflation. this context, increases in consumer prices, even though the Austrians are, you know, usually very, well, here we're trying to like talk to the mainstream in their vocabulary, um, that maybe one part of their explanation for why does it seem like if if consumer price inflation is in double digits, it seems like the economy be behaves one way versus when it's lower. I think partly too, it might be because in a regime where price inflation has been in double digits for a few years, clearly nominal interest rates have to be high just if for no other reason than the purchasing power element. But in a regime, clearly government, safe government bonds and money are different assets if the if the yield on the government bonds is 10 percent you know they're just different thing whereas in a regime where price inflation hasn't been bad and if it's like a sluggish where you know the yield on t bills is 0.3 percent the difference between actual currency and t bills isn't as big a deal and so you can see maybe why qe doesn't get as much traction and that kind of a thing where interest rates are really low do you I, I know some Keynesians were making that point that it's more of an asset swap if interest rates are at zero. So what's your question? The question is, do you think that element could also help explain? Oh, why there is no correlation at low digits? Right, why, yeah, oh, dump, yeah. Dumping yeah, yeah. In, yeah, the central bank dumping yeah. in money doesn't seem to do much if if we're in a low inflation environment, whereas once we break out of that, then all of a sudden... Yeah, if they dump in yeah. more money, then prices rise faster. And I'm saying it could partly be because of that. The yeah, there, rate. there is, yeah. and and inflationary also inflation expectations are very low under the circumstances, right? Mm -hmm. If we are hitting the inflation target, so we have inflation at two percent, for example, for a very very long time, and there is some temporary money creation, uh, then there is no, and people still believe that it's temporary. You have the same. When you open Mystery of Banking by Rothbard, you have sort of similar discussion in the early periods of inflation, even during war, right? When you have huge monetary stimulus, people can have anti-inflationary expectations and believe that increases in the money supply are temporary, and they can sort of like be a cushion. Their expectations can be a cushion against that, and we, we you would see a corresponding increases in money de demand, so more acceptance of that liquidity. Uh, that makes the inflationary influence of the money supply smaller or even non-existent. So I would think that there certainly certainly has to be an element in there. And this, and something also we did not uh, talk about, this distinction between the economy where there is low digit and there, you don't see the correlation between money supply and the price level. And then higher inflation, two digit, uh, two digit or maybe even as I discussed in the book, maybe even above 5 6%, not necessarily two digit, where you see the relationship and you see the correlation. I mean, it's not like we're sort of like jumping from one economic circumstances or one economic model or one uh, system of economic laws into another system. Mm -hmm. There has to be some transition there, right? Some middle ground, which is not really discussed in, um, in the literature at all. 
uh, which something that would be interesting to tackle, especially that 2020 what was that case for many countries that we had this transition. We sort of spiraled away from from local. Uh, generally understood equilibrium, macroeconomic equilibrium of low inflation and no relation to the money supply into the circumstances where the correlation is back with a vengeance. Yeah. Uh, so there has to be something in the middle between those two states. Uh, and it certainly has a lot to do with money demand. And that money demand, demand for money is dependent on the factors that you mentioned. Right, so if the if the money demand is acting as a cushion against creation of the money supply, that certainly will make the correlation disappear or be much 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 smaller when you have that happening. Yeah, so that thank you for saying that. That's the way to nail down my my question there, my sort of wonkish one is that if interest rates are near zero, or at least interest rates on very safe assets are near zero. Then, if the central bank, the the claim is, if the central bank comes in and you know creates a million dollars in new bank reserves, and buys a million dollars worth of T bills from some you know uh, investment bank, that from the investment bank's point of view, it's not like all of a sudden like, oh, now I have this whole different asset, my pockets are flush with cash. Let me go buy something, because you know that they, they they weren't handed the money for free. They had to give up a million dollars worth of T bills. And so, for instance, the T-bills were yielding virtually 0%, you know, on the margin, that wasn't that big of a difference. Whereas in other, in, a, in an environment where, yeah, CPI is at 7%, and so the yield on the T-bills is 7.5%, just to at least break even with a little more. There, if you, if they, if the central bank comes in and buys a million dollars worth of T-bills, and now you're sitting on cash that's yielding zero, you're not just going to let it sit there because you're, you have that opportunity cost. So that was part of it. And so the demand to hold money is lower it's, it's, it's to tie it to with the vocabulary you were using there. So it's, yep, it's still supply and demand, but with some of these things, um, yeah. you know, and when the influence, matter. yeah. And when the influence of the supply gets bigger and bigger and bigger, you have higher and higher increases in the money supply and higher and higher and higher money demand not only cannot function as a cushion anymore, it actually works works in the same way because people realize that inflation is getting higher and higher, so they they dump the money to speed up the process. Actually, mm-hmm. okay. So I think we got about six more minutes here. We've you and I are both very good at we're scholars. We go in and we can you can speak the way you know. Ah, oh, this is how Woodford would speak. I just what I just went through there was like that's how Brad DeLong was speaking in 2010. We're very good at putting on our neoclassical or our Keynesian hats and what I. So now as Austrians, what, what are these people m- missing, for example? Like for me, like I, like they just don't have a, a capital theory and they don't get that. Uh, so anyway, what, what's, what are your thoughts? Well, one, one of the things I would certainly point out is that um, reaching, targeting a specific price level, uh, at, even when it's very low, when it, even when it's single, single digit, is not a program that will necessarily lead to uh, macroeconomic stability, right? So this is the lesson. I think this is the most important lesson from Hayek's works. Uh, it's what? It's 40-year anniversary, right? Nobel Prize uh, for Hayek this year. Mm-hmm. 40 years. 40 years ago, he got Wait, the Nobel 40 Prize. 40 or 50? Uh, okay, 50, sorry. <laughs> I'm so old. Okay. Yes. Austrians aren't good at math. <laughs> right. <laughs> Sorry, yeah, so it's 50-year anniversary, of course. So it's 50 years. And the most important lesson from his work is that stable prices do not mean stable macroeconomic conditions. And I think this is something that is missing. So even though, well, my book is focused on the idea of, um, of how spiraling out from the corridor of direct inflation targeting can happen and can be uh, can be seen even perhaps potentially when he, when we have significantly uh, high increases in the money supply, right? So we are talking in the borderline case where things go out of control and most economists see it happening, uh, going out of the control, right? Because double digit inflation like we had mm-hmm. is just a basically is just a, a, well, not maybe a disaster. A disaster would be 100%, but, but still 15%, like most 95% of economists agree that it's not 
those conditions are not good for the economy when we have such high inflation. Mm-hmm. But this is this is the case where we have a sort of agreement. And I, my point is that uh, some uh, memory, at least, or some injection of uh, of the focus on the quantity uh, of money may help to actually predict uh, that in the future. Or at least we should uh, consider doing some doing some research demonstrating that, because I end with with some open suggestions there. But this is a, this is the case of a crisis where most people agree. But even assuming the other way, we still have the question whether uh, stable sort of stable inflation, two three percent inflation, price inflation, happening because of the monetary stimulus, we we should still ask the question whether that is desirable. Because even under those circumstances, as we've seen twenty years ago, just a few years before two thousand and eight. Even under those circumstances, or as we've seen, of course, in the classic case of 1920s uh, and in many other historical cases, uh, monetary policy that is aimed at at targeting a specific final price level is not a a recipe for macroeconomic stability. And you you can have huge problems in the asset markets and in the capital market uh, happening because of that. Uh, there was some change for some amount of time after 2008. Um, I remember it was Mishkin, perhaps. Yeah, I think it could have been Mishkin who, who, who wrote papers. Uh, that was a paper entitled, Should the Central Bank Pay Attention to Asset Prices? Yeah. And yeah. basically the conclusion was no. <laughs> the, the timing was horrible <laughs> All right. because a year or two, year af- two years after that, <laughs> everything changed and suddenly everyone started to say, okay, maybe we should pay attention to asset prices. Maybe final prices is not everything we should be focused on. And I think that's an important lesson that has been provided by Hayek and then has been, uh, has been provided for, for many years after him by the Austrians. Uh, and it relates to what you said, to capital theory, or at least to uh, to focus on the uh, on something else than just the consumer sector as a final uh, representation of macroeconomic stability. Mm-hmm. Well, yeah. So to, just to fill in some of the gaps there for the listeners who might not be hip deep in this stuff, right? So mainstream economists, as, as Matt says here, they recognize that oh yeah, there's problems with large scale inflation, but when it, when they spell out what it is, it's it's not it, it's the kind of thing like oh there's expectations and it may might introduce coordination problems and things like that or they might say well you got to re- keep printing new menus if they you know stuff like yeah <laughs> but that's fair enough but yeah the I, but the Austrian notion of the, there could be an unsustainable boom because monetary policy is too easy and then that leads to an inevitable crash you can't even tell that story if you just have like a a one good you know, where oh, there's just one good in the economy and it can be capital and then you can use it to create consumption. But like it was, I just know this meant when I was in NYU trying to talk to my classmates about this stuff, like just to even to convey the Austrian, because one guy said to me, he goes, oh, so it's an overinvestment story. And it was, no, it's male investment. And those are different. But in a yeah. simplistic model, the worst that can happen is, oh, if, if they save too much, then that means the capital stock is higher than it ought to be in terms of intertemporal consumption smoothing. But it's not that all of a sudden in three years, they're going to say, oh, wait a minute, we have a bunch of hammers and not enough nails. Like that's not going to happen because they don't have hammers and nails in their model. It's just one good that can be yeah. consumption or capital. And, so. and, and to, to, uh, to boost your point, uh, most monetary rules, when they are presented, uh, they are presented with two variables. That is monetary rule by setting this interest rate. And the interest rate decides about, on the one hand, about the price level. And then on the other hand, it decides about the so-called output gap mm-hmm. that we already discussed at some other time in some other podcast. And the output gap is just one index for the whole economy, right? So it, it compares the GDP, total GDP that we have right now, with some conceptual, counterfactual potential product that we could have had. But it's still an aggregate, and you don't have this aggregation of that into various uh, various sectors and stages. So, so even when you have the inclusion of, of of real production, it is the inclusion of just one variable, sort of like treating an economy like it's one good, and therefore you could have just overinvestment, right? Mm-hmm. Or or being it too high and not being it, for example, uh, not sustainable in in certain parts of the economy. 
Okay, we need to wrap up there. My guest has been Matt Mahai. Here's his book from Routledge or booklet, Monetary Policy and Inflation. Matt, if people, do you write things for the for the general public if they want to see more of your stuff? Uh, I used to write some of it. Uh, probably on Mises.org, you can find my older articles. Okay. Uh, but, but yeah, in the recent years, I, I did not write much for, okay. for the web. Website. All right, so they can find your stuff. So yeah, you you and I just I didn't say it in the beginning, folks. Matt and I have known each other for a while, um, crossing paths always in, in Auburn. Twenty well, years. Twenty years. Wow. Okay. Thirty years after Hayek wins the Nobel Prize. <laughs> That's when we met. Okay. Exactly. <laughs> well, thanks, Matt, for your time and for writing this book. Thank you. Thank you, Bob. It was a pleasure. And thanks everybody for tuning in. We'll see you next time. Check back next week for a new episode of the Human Action Podcast. In the meantime, you can find more content like this on Mises.org.